Father in heaven, thank you for your kindness. You know our needs. Please address them in Jesus' name. Amen. What warning was given when the demand for Israel's release had, had been first presented to the king of Egypt to Pharaoh? Exodus 4 says, 22 and 23, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son. I like the words. It's also speaking to you. Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And then the decision Pharaoh had to make. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Every day we have to make choices, and every choice has consequences. Though despised by the Egyptians, the Israelites had been honored by God in that they were singled out to be the depositaries of his law. Not that they were so smart. They, they, I think they were the most degraded nation upon the face of the earth. God chooses, not the best, but those who are willing. In the special blessings and privileges accorded them, they had preeminence among the nations as the firstborn son had among his brothers. The judgment of which Egypt had first been warned was to be the last visited. You'll enjoy this last part of the Exodus series. God is long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. He has a tender care for the beings formed in his image, that's you and me. If the loss of their harvests and their flocks and herds had brought Egypt to repentance, the children would not have been smitten. But the nation had stubbornly resisted the divine command. And now the final blow was about to fall. We have to give an account of our bad deeds. God is gracious, but a time of reckoning usually comes. Be careful what ways you are pursuing. Moses had been forbidden on pain of death to appear again in Pharaoh's presence. But the last message from God was to be delivered to the rebellious monarch. And again Moses came before him with a terrible announcement. <clears throat> then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh, your majesty, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the animals. This is a terrible plague. There was still time for Pharaoh to repent. There's still time for you and me to repent. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. Can you imagine weeping because of the death of your firstborn? Such as was not like it before, nor shall be it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue. Uh, an interesting expression. I'm reading it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. By the way, if you're a Christian and suffering a little, the Lord will make a difference between you and your enemies. Eventually, he's going to triumph in your life. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you. After that I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. Phew. The Lord through Moses gave direction to Israel concerning their preservation from the coming judgment. 
over a period of an hour, uh, of a year, all the Israelites gathered in Goshen near Afaris. Each family, alone or in connection with others, was to slay a lamb or a kid without blemish, and with a bunch of hyssop sprinkle its blood on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house that the destroying angel coming at midnight might not enter that dwelling. The blood will be a sign. I will pass over you when I see the blood. They were to eat the flesh roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs at night. As Moses said, with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. They listened as Moses gave the instructions. 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I love this verse, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Another seven plagues are coming, my friend. If you have the blood of Christ, the life of Christ, covering your life, God will pass by and the plagues will not fall upon you. How were they to commemorate their great deliverance? We should never forget how God delivered us in the past. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. As they should keep the feast in future years, they were to repeat to their children the story of the great deliverance as Moses bade them. Tell your children what a good God he is. Tell them about how he helped you in times past. 26, 27, and it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by the service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. It's a sweet story, the story of deliverance of redemption. Furthermore, the firstborn of both man and beast were to be the Lord's, to be bought back only by ransom in acknowledgement that when the firstborn in Egypt perished, that of Israel, though graciously preserved, had been justly exposed to the same doom, but for the atoning sacrifice. Numbers 3.13 All the firstborn are mine. Are you a firstborn? You are the Lord's. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. Now, after the institution of the tabernacle service, the Lord chose the tribe of Levi for the work of the sanctuary instead of the firstborn of the people. Numbers 8, verse 16. For they are wholly given to me from among the children of Israel. I've taken them for myself instead of all the op instead of all who open the wound, the firstborn of all the children of Israel. So now we have a replacement. The tribe of Levi replaced the work of the firstborn. The Passover 
was to be both commemorative and typical. Not only pointing back to the deliverance of Egypt, as you see on the slide, but forward to the greater deliverance with Christ was to accomplish in freeing his people from the bondage of sin. Beautiful to focus on two great deliverances, the past and the future. How does Paul explain it? The Lamb represents the Lamb of God in whom is our only hope of salvation. Dependence is so important. Jesus, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And Paul takes us back to that night, that midnight event, when God delivered his people. The entire Bible is filled with references back to the great Exodus. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. It was not enough that the Paschal Lamb be slain. Its blood must be sprinkled upon the doorposts. Action. So the merits of Christ's blood must be applied to the soul, his life. We must believe not only that he died for the world, but that he died for us individually. Make it something personal. We must appropriate to ourselves the virtue of the atoning sacrifice. Have you done that? It's very important. It's a sweet experience. The hyssop used in sprinkling the blood was the symbol of purification. What a lovely institution, purification. Its significance is also seen in the psalmist's prayer, Psalms 51, 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. God can take the blackest sinner and make him white as snow. If you need a little bit of white, go to him. The lamb was to be prepared whole, not a bone of it being broken. Type, anti-type, yes. The little lamb pointed forward to the anti-typical lamb, Jesus Christ. John 19, 36, For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. A reference back to the first Passover. The Genesis, the Exodus story. Before obtaining freedom, the bondmen must show their faith in the great deliverance about to be accomplished. I want to repeat this. Before obtaining freedom, they longed for it. The bondmen, the Israelites, must show their faith in the great deliverance about to be accomplished. The token of blood must be placed upon their houses and they must separate themselves and their families from the Egyptians and gather within their own dwelling. At times, we've got to separate from the ungodly. This precedes the great deliverance. As Moses rehearsed to Israel the provisions of God for their deliverance, the people bowed their heads and worshipped. What a beautiful image. What will happen to us? as we study God's prop provisions for our salvation, we will also bow our heads and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Bow our heads and worship. You worship much better when you study the Bible and discover God's love and his redemptive power. What happened to the many Egyptians who had been led to acknowledge the God of the Hebrews as the only true God? There were many of them. 
they beg to be, to be permitted to find shelter in the homes of Israel when the destroying angel should pass through the land. They've learned that God is in control and they wanted to be with people who acknowledge him as the God who controls everything. How were they received into the homes of the Israelites? They were gladly welcomed and they pledged themselves henceforth to serve the God of Jacob and to go forth from Egypt with his people. I love this. They were conversions and God was so happy. Swiftly and secretly, they made their preparations for departure. Their families were gathered, the paschal lamb slain, the flesh roasted with fire, the unleavened bread and bitter herbs prepared, the father and priest of the household sprinkled the blood upon the doorpost and joined his family within the dwelling. Can you see this family in their dwelling? In haste and silence, the paschal lamb was eaten. Are they eating? In awe, the people prayed and watched. The heart of the eldest born, from the strongest man down to the little child, throbbing with indefinable dread. What's going to happen? Fathers and mothers clasped in their arms their loved firstborn as they thought of the fearful stroke that was to fall that night. Can you see it? Can you imagine yourself in that position, holding your firstborn? God, please save my child. We've applied the blood. But no dwelling of Israel was visited by the death-dealing angel. The sign of the blood, the sign of a Savior's protection was on their doors, and the destroyer did not enter. Wow! Their safety in a dedicated life to God. Exodus 12, 29, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon of all the firstborn of livestock. Hmm. What broke the silence of the night, that Egyptian night? And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not one, for there was not, for there was not one dead. For there was not a house where there was not one dead. Every home wailed, wept, sobbed. For there was not a house where there was not one dead. This could have been prevented. We can prevent certain calamities. The pride of every household had been laid low. The shrieks and wails of the mourners filled that dark night in Egypt. Now his heaven-daring pride humbled to the dust. He called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord, as ye have said, and take your flocks, Remember, he wanted the flocks to stay behind. And take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone. And bless me also, what arrogance. The royal counselors also and the people entreated the Israelites to depart out of the land in haste. And they said, we be all dead men. Exodus 12, 31, 32. Then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord, as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, 
as you have said and be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes and on their shoulders. Can you see the people ready to go? Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of, the law of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. The Lord can change hearts. So they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Some of the gold objects which I've taken pictures of in Egypt, man, the poor paupers, became billionaires overnight. What an experience. The end for God's people are always tremendous. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses, that's Afaris, to Sukkot, Tel El Mashkuta, about 600,000 men on foot besides children. Uh, here I'm standing with my white hat at Afaris, the ancient capital of uh, the Hyksos. Eventually Ramses came there and he built the city and he called it after his name, but that was long after the Exodus. And on the right, I'm walking at uh, Sukkot, Tel El Mashkuta. There you can see the two places on the map. Loretta is picking up some potsherds at Afaris. I'm touching stuff from afar us and reliving the experience of that night. Piram says, uh, these are all places in that vicinity. It's interesting to do research there and you can read uh, Professor Bittak's book on afar us. A mixed multitude, who were they, went up with them also and flocks and herds a great deal of livestock. From here, Wadi Tumilat, ancient Goshen, Afaris, the great trek began at midnight. Will God also deliver his people at midnight at the second coming? Egyptians who, impressed by the power of the God of the Hebrews, sought a share in the blessings of those who served him, and at the same time to escape the tyranny of the king. Also Hyksos and other Semites who had been detained by the pharaohs. So here you've got a mixed multitude. There they go. Some at least were the descendants of the Hebrews who had intermarried with the Egyptians. They were always first to regret their departure from Egypt and to the lust after its delicacies. So uh, sometimes the motives are not as they should be. By the way, why do you serve God? We should examine our motives. Four and five. Now the, mix, now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Verse 6, but now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. That a difficulty to accept God's health message. By the way, have you got a problem like the mixed multitude? We need God in a very special way. 39. 
and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. The Israelites paused briefly at Sukkot, Tel El Mashkuta, where Loretta is standing, to make final preparations for the long desert journey. Here is Tel El Mashkuta, large Semitic ruins here at Tel El Mashkuta, the biblical Sukkot. Remains of large amounts of mud bricks at Tel El Mashkuta, biblical Sukkot. You know, it's a, it's a thrilling experience to visit these sites. The length of their stay here is not mentioned, but it was long enough for them to bake the bread they would need for the days immediately ahead. Can you smell the baking of bread here at Sukkot, Tel El Mashkuta? Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Fulfillment of prophecy. And you know, God knows exactly the date of his second coming. I don't know it. But when that day arrives, we're going home. Loretta, when did they leave Egypt? Can you tell me the date, my child? First Kings 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year, after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Solomon's fourth year, according to my research, was in 970 BC. Add 480, and what do you get? 1450. And if you add 430 to 1450, you come to 1880. How old was Abram when God told him in 1880, 1880 at Haran, that he would deliver his posterity after 430 years. When you add 75 years to 1880, you arrive at Abram's date of birth, 1955, almost 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. You know, if we celebrate God's deliverance, God's kindness, we will never fall back in our spiritual Christian experience. Make a note of the way he's leading you and keep it in your mind. Certain additional regulations concerning the Passover were given at Sukkot. These were rendered necessary because of the many non-Israelites who had joined the Hebrews and deal mainly with these strangers. Provision was made whereby they might participate in the Paschal Feast and share its blessings. Interesting facts. 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. That is, one of the alien race who wished to retain his status as a foreigner and to remain uncircumcised. That clears up this statement by God. Since the Passover was sig significant as the festival commemorating Israel's birth as a nation, it would naturally be inappropriate for a foreigner to participate in it. God is very fair. 
but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. It was not through natural descent, but by virtue of a divine call that Israel had become the people of the Lord. Important point to remember. Being destined in that capacity to be a blessing to all nations, Israel was not to assume an exclusive attitude toward foreigners. May God help us not to be exclusive, but to, in, to be inclusive like God is. All the nations of the earth were welcome to join God's people, on condition, of course. They were to welcome those who desired to join them in the worship and service of God. Being incorporated politically and economically, these strangers were also to be accepted religiously through the rite of circumcision. And that's what we modern Israel should do. Well, circumcision, biblical facts, supported by archaeological facts. Thus they became one with God's people and were permitted to participate in a Passover ritual. 1248. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it, says the Lord. Explanation? Why not? Temporary residents and servants working for wages were not to eat of the Passover, for their relationship to Israel might be dissolved at any time. God wants us to invite people who want to be with him forever. 46, 47. In one house it shall be eaten, you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Type, anti-type. Although the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world was crucified as a common criminal, none of his bones were broken in spite of the fact that it was usual custom to do so. By the way, you're looking at the only evidence of a crucifixion. The nail went through the heel of this person, hit something hard in the beam of the cross, and archaeologists had to cut this off, and they found this in his ashuary, small coffin. This was done uh, to the two companions just as the crucified antitype was treated differently from other crucified men, so was the Passover lamb prepared differently. The bones of the other lambs eaten during the year might be broken to extract the marrow. 14, 8, 49, And when a strange stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let them and let him come near and keep it, and he shall be a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. God is fair. fifty fifty one Thus all the children of Israel did, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. And it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. They were organized. God wants us to be organized. What a sight. An artist impression of the passing through the Red Sea. Can you see the Ten Commandments over there? 
May God prepare our minds to comprehend the theme of salvation a little better as we study the miracle of the Exodus. Someone wrote these words. It was love for me that nailed him to a tree to die in agony for all my sin. For my own guilt and blame, the great Redeemer came, willing to bear the shame of all my sin. To Calvary's hill one day the Lord was led away, none else the price could pay for all my sin. He on the cross was slain, healing his life in pain. He felt the bitter stain of all my sin. Was ever love so strong, was ever crime so wrong, when Jesus suffered long for all my sin. He saw my greatest need, became my friend indeed. Through him I have been freed of all my sin. Oh, what a Saviour is mine. In him God's mercies combine. His love can never decline. And he loves me. And he loves you. Father in heaven, thank you for being a redeeming God. Thank you for the miracle of the Exodus. And we need to feel your power in delivering us from certain emotions, hatred, jealousy, bitterness. Come into our hearts and clean up. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you.